Well, shall we start? Yes. Are we are we on the air now? So I see. Yeah, we are. Okay. So we started our discussion, and actually, it's, it is time to do it officially. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. The Kiev School of Economics continues its initiative, Global Minds for Ukraine, with an extraordinary event. I'm Ivan Gomza, head of the Department of Public Policy. Here is Volodymyr Fedorin, is a founding editor of Forbes Ukraine, and he will co-moderate our talk. And we are both really delighted to host an outstanding guest, Dr. Anne Applebaum. Dr. Anne Applebaum is a renowned scholar who studied the history of communism in Central Eastern Europe. And among others, she published a very fine article on the Leninist origins of the repressions of civil society. In addition, Dr. Applebaum is an accomplished author of several books, including Red Famine and my personal favorite, Twilight of Democracy. Besides, Dr. Applebaum rarely stays secluded in the ivory tower of academia, being a daring journalist. So I am not mistaken, she visited Kyiv to interview President Zelensky after the Russia-Ukrainian war had erupted. So hopefully it is not an overstretch to say that Anne Applebaum is a real friend of Ukraine. So thank you for being with us today. And I hope that we will have a really interesting discussion. I it, hope, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person. I, I did come to Kiev last week, but for a variety of reasons, um, it had to be a short trip. Um, I was traveling with my editor, he had to return early and I had to travel with him because we had to write our article on the train. Um, so, so, so we, we did interview the president. We then spent a day, um, looking at, we went to the Northern suburbs, um, to Irpin and Bucha, and then we had to go back. Um, so I, it was, it was short, but I hope I can, I hope I can come back again. Um, and I'm, uh, next time I'll, we'll do this in person. Hopefully. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start and let's start with a critical question. You are, among others, a scholar of genocide. And actually, I would like to, to explain our friends, what are the indicators of genocide? In what respects is genocide different from atrocities and war crimes? And finally, and most crucially, are Putin's intentions and Russian actions in Ukraine genocidal from the scholarly point of view? So the, the term genocide is is a difficult one because there's there are two kinds of definitions. There are some legal definitions that are attached to UN treaties and UN conventions, um, and then there is um, you know a more a more popular or um, kind of moral way of defining genocide. Um, you, you know, of course, I'm, most of you probably know this, but it seems significant to me that the person who invented the word genocide, it was a word that was composed of, you know, of sort of Greek roots, was uh, born in Ukraine. Um, Raphael Lemkin was a lawyer um, born in the Lviv area, and he went to the university in Lviv. I mean, of course, it was then Poland, but um, it was part of the, the, the interwar Polish Republic. But um, one of the things he, he wrote about during his lifetime was his experience of living in a part of the world where, um, you know, different nations have historically tried to wipe one another out. And so, you know, the, the concept of genocide very much comes out of Ukrainian historical experience or Central European historical experience. Um, and his, his, his definition, what he meant by genocide was the attempt to eradicate another nation as a nation. And so in his mind, that included not just mass murder, but also, attacks on culture, on churches, attacks on language, um, an attempt to eliminate people, um, to eliminate an, a, a nation and a culture completely. Um, and, um, you know, and there, and there, you know, one of the things that has misled people, I think, over the years, or not misled, but has shaped our conversation about genocide, um, is that the first time that that word was used legally was in the context of the Holocaust. Um, and so since then, people have looked at other situations where, you know, one nation has tried to wipe out another and they've said, well, it's not quite the same as the Holocaust. But really the definition, Lemkin's definition um, is a little bit broader than that. And I think would certainly include, and at this point, even legally, I think this would include 
Russian intentions in Ukraine. So the, the, the language that the Russians are using, you know, that Ukraine is not a state, Ukrainians are not real people. Um, anybody who says they're Ukrainian is really a Nazi. Um, we are allowed to kill Ukrainians because they're Nazis, um, you know, by definition, because of the, because they say they're Ukrainians. Um, and then their behavior, um, which is you know, the deliberate targeting of civilians, the deliberate murder, um, uh, you know, they, they arrive in, in these, even in some towns and villages with lists of people um, who are Ukrainian leaders and so on. Um, the attempt to, you know, erase and eliminate any traces of Ukrainianness. Um, I think this is genocidal behavior, yes. Um, it, you know, it, it may not mean that they're trying to kill every single Ukrainian, um, which was what Hitler tried to do the Jews. And so that is a, that's a nuance of difference. Um, but certainly the, the intent, which is to eliminate Ukrainians as a nation, as a race, or whatever you want to call them, as a, as a people, is there. It's now very firmly part of Russian culture and Russian popular culture and Russian television culture. Um, it's been inculcated and spread deliberately. Um, I actually just written something about this and it's coming out next week. Um, you know, the, the idea also that Ukraine is a fake state that has been somehow used by the West as a tool against Russia, that it's not a real place. I mean, all those, those ideas and images have been part of Russian um, propaganda now for 10 years um, and, and, and quite fiercely. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is the effect of that use of genocidal language. I mean, soldiers seem to be convinced by it. We hear on some of the phone calls they make back home that some, you know, their relatives and wives back in Russia are also convinced by it. Um, and so, yes, in that, in certainly in that, in that context, we can, we can talk about genocide. Okay, thank you. And the idea occurs to me, there is a good text by Rebecca Stern mm -hmm. where she introduces the notion of libracide, mm -hmm. like the destruction of books, for instance, uh, uh, holy books or cultural books. And we actually see this part of uh, violent action here in Ukraine as well. In Kherson, the Russian troops actually, they destroyed Ukrainian books. But uh, so I, I concur actually, this is a genocidal intention and some genocidal actions. But now let's make it even more complicated because President Macron, among others, he continues to refer to Ukrainians and Russians like two brother nations. And thus he explains there could be no genocide. And I myself could not sincerely believe that a person, the president of France, who got his education at Sciences Po, that he could really be ignorant that Bosniaks and Serbs actually were kinsmen. And despite all this, there was Srebrenica. Instead, I suppose, the rhetoric of brethren reveals that some Western politicians eschew acknowledging the fact of the genocide. So my question to you, what would it take for the West actually to acknowledge what we scholars are already acknowledging? So in the case of Macron, I mean, I obviously have not discussed this with him, so, you know, I, I don't know, but um, in the case of Macron and some other politicians, um, there is, I'm, I'm hearing now the argument that, I mean, I'm just, I'm just explaining what the argument is. The argument is that we should not call, we should not talk about war crimes and we should not talk about genocide when speaking to Putin um, because we want to um, allow him some way out of the war. Um, so there is a argument among some diplomats that it's this is not the time to use that language um, because we you know we do want him to leave Ukraine and withdraw his troops um, and therefore it's not useful right now to to talk about him as a war criminal because we may need to negotiate with him um, we may need to get him to agree to some international agreements and declaring him a criminal and setting up prosecutions at the international you know, international courts will impede that process. And, and well, I might, and maybe you might disagree with that analysis. I don't think it's a bad faith analysis. In other words, I don't think Macron is doing that, you know, because he's anti-Ukrainian or because he, you know, doesn't, you know, because he, he you know, he doesn't see what's happening. Uh, you know, I, 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 my guess is that he does see what's happening. It's just that he, you know, believes that there's a different, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a solution to the war that might require some cooperation of Putin, and therefore it's better not to eliminate him right, so right now. It is somehow <laughs> akin to a situation when there is a hostage crisis, 
and you don't want actually to aggravate the feelings of the, something, of the speaker. Something, something like that. Or it's not even about his feelings, it's just that we might need him to be involved in some kind of diplomatic conversation to end the war. Um, and as I said, I don't, I don't think that's an illegitimate argument. I don't, you know, it has a, it has a basis in reality. Um, and the, the follow-up could be that, well, you know, later on we'll talk about, um, you know, these things and what happened when we're, you know, in a position to do something about it. It's also important to remember, and this, I haven't myself decided what I feel about it, but, you know, there's another argument that says calling Putin a war criminal and calling for him to be investigated now when we don't have the power to do anything about it there is no court that can make him come from moscow to the hague you know or from you know to 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 to, to some kind of nuremberg trial while we don't have the power to do it it's a little bit impotent and um you know it's like play acting it's a it's it's, it's a performance rather than a real investigation um, and I, I accept that that argument has some legitimacy too, you know, that it's better to wait until we have a real moment. What I do think is important, and as I, I you know, I could see even in Kiev, the, just the brief time I was there that this is happening, is that Ukrainians begin to document what's happening as accurately as possible so that there is a real historical record, um, including both, you know, basic facts, but also deep interviews with people um, getting people's stories down, recording them, um, preserving them, and beginning to think about how to use them or how to present them to the world in, in maybe in a variety of different ways, maybe in a legal form as a, you know, eventually as a lawsuit, maybe in a, um, maybe in, you know, in, in plays and movies, where, you know, there are a lot of different ways in which you could, you'll eventually want to tell the story. And I think that's the, that should be the priority now um, to, to, to do that. I mean, you know, a counter argument is that, you know, given that Putin has committed these criminal acts and that he has used this genocidal eliminationist language about Ukraine, you know, is there any real deal that can ever be done with him? I mean, is he is he somebody who's who's capable of creating an agreement with any countries? I mean, not just with Europe and or, or with Ukraine. Um, you know, is there a is there a is there a format in which we could ever rely on anything that he says? And that's an you know, I don't have an answer to that either. I think probably there's not. Um, you know, I know that the President Zelensky and people around him are thinking about what kind of. I mean, some people are beginning to think about how could this war eventually end. Um, and one of the things they're thinking about is could there be some system of security guarantee that would ensure that you know if Putin breaks rules that are set up after the war that there would be automatic sanctions or some kind of automatic reaction and we wouldn't need to have this months of debate. Um, and so maybe maybe there is some, you know, there's some alternative world system we could come up with that would have better and more timely ways to respond to this kind of crime, but right now we don't have it. So, so there is a danger of, as I say, first of all, doing something that would make some solution in the end difficult. Second of all, there's a danger of empty gestures, you know, saying we're going to prosecute you and then not being able to do it. Um, you know, I think on balance, I would, I, I'm still in favor of using the word genocide and continuing to investigate this as a case of genocide. Um, and, you know, but, but, but I wouldn't eliminate all other views as evidence of lack of knowledge. Oh, well, thank you for such a elaboration on this issue. It was really... Maybe it's more nuanced than you wanted, but that's... Just... <laughs> No, actually, what I'm, I, thinking I, I, I'm here to, to have a meaningful discussion and you're actually doing a great job. The only problem is actually I'm thinking that, you know, we, humanity, I mean, we have quite a poor record uh, while persecuting the gen genocidaire. Uh, those genocidaire in Rwanda, they actually remained free. And then there was the first, the great war of Congo, of Africa. And uh, the genocidaire in uh, Indonesia, they actually remained free and actually quite rich. I mean, they had have many assets. So our record here is poor. But OK, yes. uh, you actually touch a question I also eager to discuss. It is about the repercussions. So how do you think 
what do you think would be the societal and political repercussions of the war? In particular, I'm interested in your opinion. So will the war consolidate or rather further dismantle the liberal, liberal consensus, liberal order? So is, it, is there any hope for liberalism now or the golden age of liberalism is, is a turned page? So, I mean, I think, you know, the war is an illustration of the fact that, you know, the this so-called liberal world order is really only, it's only as good as the willingness of its members to defend it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact is that the, the, the US and Europe are defending it now in their defense of Ukraine. Um, but I also hope that one of the conclusions that people will come to when the war is over um, is that we need new and new and better institutions um, that the you know the the poor performance of the United Nations um, in this conflict I mean obviously because one of it the member leading members of the Security Council is, is a you know is the aggressor in the war um, but but also this the 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 fact that other institutions took so long to react um, you know th this war has been discussed and predicted and, debated for eight years. <laughs> I mean, I actually expected the invasion of Mariupol in the summer of 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it took a long time to happen, um, you know, is, is really the surprising part. Um, and the fact that despite the fact that it was so clear and it was the Russians have been preparing for it and they've been preparing for it not only militarily, but also, as I've said, kind of you know, ideologically and in, in terms of their propaganda, um, you know, and, and yet we were somehow surprised and, you know, the U.S. didn't have quite the wep right weapons in display and, um, you know, we weren't quite ready for it when it happened. We didn't have, you know, it took, you know, instead of having automatic sanctions everywhere on the first day, you know, it took us a few weeks to kind of get them in place and still they're not all in place. I mean, that, you know, that to me is an indication that people, um, people didn't take this threat seriously and they didn't believe in it. They didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't understand it. And the institutions weren't really, you know, the, the, the early warning signs weren't sufficient. Um, and so one of the things I hope is that coming out of this war, we'll have a, you know, better and more aware and more um, intelligent kind of early warning systems in place, and we'll have thought through better what our reaction will be next time. Um, one of the problems with, you know, the sort of American West European attitude to autocracy, and especially it's Russian and Belarusian um, autocracy in the last decade has been that every time some kind of new horrible violation happens, we're surprised. So whether it's, you know, the Belarusians hijacking a plane, whether it's the Russians murdering somebody in the center of Berlin, you know, or in the center of London, um, you know, every time it happens, we, you know, we are shocked and surprised and we, you know, what do we, how do we react? What do we do? And we draw up a list of sanctions and we announce, you know, a lot of things. And, you know, rather than doing that, it's more important to, in, in the future, to be aware that these things will happen and to announce in advance what the price is or what the cost will be. Um, for, you know, for this kind of thing. So think, thinking a little bit differently about how we do diplomacy, how we use sanctions, how we, um, how we react to these kinds of violations, is, is I, I hope that's one of the things we'll do coming out of the war. Okay, thank you. You know, I have like a kind of a historical parallel in my mind. Mm, in the dark years of the Second World War, World War, nobody actually believed that liberal ideas would come eventually in, in full glory. I mean, I think in 1942, nobody was sure that liberal ideas could have the stage in the world politics. And then after that turmoil and that ordeal, actually liberal ideas become dominant. So how do you think, could we expect a revival for liberal ideas or no? Maybe. I mean, a lot depends on leadership. Um, you know, the a lot of the institutions that we think of as the key to, you know, protecting and defending the, the Western liberal world during the Cold War, like NATO and, um, 
you know, you know, were were the result of um, particular people pushing them, pushing for them. You know, in the United States, it was Harry Truman, who was a president who was not, you know, didn't have, didn't arrive in office with great expectations of glory. You know, he was from a small town. He didn't have any foreign policy experience. Roosevelt didn't even trust him. He was Roosevelt's vice president. Roosevelt didn't even trust him enough to tell him about the atomic bomb. Um, so he was, you know, he came to office really new and he, and, but, and, but yet he understood the scale of the problem quite quickly and began the work of creating the institutions that were needed to protect it. I mean, the same is true of the European Union, which was, um, you know, was also was, was there was nothing inevitable about the about that. I mean, it was also the creation of a particularly dedicated group of politicians, you know, in Germany, the Netherlands, in particular, you know, France, um, Belgium after the war, who who pushed for a particular vision and tried to make it happen. Um, and so these things don't happen automatically. You know, there's nothing, there's no rule that says, you know, just because we've had this moment of international solidarity that, that will translate into something longer lasting. A lot will depend on what, um, you know, Biden and Macron, if he's reelected and, you know, Zelensky and, um, you know, the leaders of other European countries do um, in the aftermath of the conflict and whether they see this as a moment when things need to be re changed and reshaped or whether they miss that moment. So leadership, good leadership, leadership. is the answer. But, okay. Yes. Uh, another kind of a parallel I'm thinking about is the 1991 when President Bush senior, I mean, he declared solemnly that the US had won the Cold War, but the outcome was far from granted. During the bleak 1970s, the USA and its allies, they seemed to be on the losing side. You remember, yes, yes the uh, pump crisis, the problems in Italy with budgets and so on. So uh, the liberal order was actually in retreat. And finally, West, it was successful. So what ma made the West successful? And is there anything in the recipe to be emulated today? That's an interesting question. I mean, I haven't, I would have to think about it before giving you a better answer. Um, but you're right that the 1970s were a moment when people really despaired of America. And it was just after the terrible disaster of Vietnam. Um, it was, you know, as you said, it's time of high oil prices. And there was a lot of talk about, you know, American and Western decline. Um, I mean, if you if you look back historically at what happened, I mean, I can, you know, I, not, none of these is a full explanation. I mean, one was again this question of leadership. Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States, and he reinvoked a kind of, you know, it was this strange American combination of sort of American nationalism plus democracy promotion, mm -hmm. um, in which the Americans saw their rule in the world as a you know, the leading sponsor of and protector of democracy. And that was somehow combined with a belief in national renewal as well. Um, you know, it's a very peculiar, as I said, American phenomenon, which is, is both internal and external. And it has some ugly sides as well as some good sides. Um, and part, partly was that he revived that, also that that is, it's a kind of big, it's a big, part of American political culture, both right wing and left wing, there's sort of different versions of it. And he was able to reinvoke that. Um, I think partly was also um, economic innovation. Um, one of the things that started to happen in the 1980s, and then, you know, continuing further was that the United States and Europe began to outpace the Soviet Union in terms of technology, innovation. It's not, it's not just about being richer, although that they, they were also richer. It was also about um, you know, being so far ahead of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union fell behind very dramatically um, and its leaders knew that. I mean, funny enough, it was, apparently was the KGB that really knew it and understood it the best because they were the people who traveled around the world and they could see. Um, but Gorbachev was very sensitive to the idea that you know, the Soviet Union was falling behind. And you know, his idea was that he would revive the Soviet Union through the, um, you know, through through Glasnost and Perestroika, which um, you know the opposite happened. He didn't revive the Soviet Union. He eventually broke it up because the Soviet system was not able to. Um, you know, once you allowed people to speak the truth, then 
um, the, you know, faith and belief in the system itself fell apart. Um, but, but so I think, you know, so it was a, I would say a combination of these ideas plus technology, um, you know, plus the failure, you know, the, the Soviet failure um, combined, you know, are, are what made that possible. And I suppose today, therefore, you'd have to talk about some kind of revival inside the United States of our democracy, which is also in trouble. I mean, maybe that's sort of a, another long story. Um, and that would have to, that revival would have to come together with a renewed dedication to the protection of democracy around the world. I mean, you have almost, you know, it's an interesting moment in the US where you have, I mean, for the first time really, since anyone can remember, you have the right and the left both supporting the same cause. I mean, Ukraine is actually a popular cause in, in you know, in both political parties. I think it's like the only one. I mean, there's no, nothing else. Um, uh, that we can, we can actually I can tell you one we just didn't make it into the written version of our interview but I think I said to President Zelensky and I was asking him a question about I said you know you realize that your rhetoric has united you know the right and left in America and he sort of looks at me and says you know great you know thank you you know, <laughs> you know how is that useful to me you know <laughs> so he he was happy that we were happy you know but. Um, you know, but 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 some some version of that, which could be precipitated by this by the Ukraine crisis, although not necessarily. Um, plus the gap, you know, the technology gap that really might now begin to grow between um, Europe and America and the democratic world, which I would also include demo democracies in Asia and elsewhere um, and Russia, which has now been, you know, is now has become much more cut off in terms of trade and technology from the outside world than, than I think it was since like the 1970s. I mean, I think even in the 80s, there were more and better, you know, certainly the late 80s and or 90s, there were more and better contacts between Russia and, and the rest of the world than there are now. Um, and so he is just, they've just taken a gigantic step backwards um, in a lot of ways. And so maybe those combination of things um, can, you know, can at least help. I mean, remember there are many, more spheres of this struggle other than Europe, um, but at least in the kind of European, you know, theater, you know, in the European, um, you know, in the European conversation, maybe this combination of a, you know, the, the Western alliance, which will hopefully soon come to include Ukraine in a more clear way, um, um, pl plus the, the innovation gains and the, the, the way in which Russia is about to fall behind, maybe those things together will create that kind of revival that we saw in the 19, you know, late 80s. Thank you, thank you. I am actually recalling a, a very interesting book by Philip Ter, where he explains that actually the digitalization started in the Anglo-Saxon world precisely when Reagan and Thatcher came to power. And that gave that push for innovation, for outpacing the already declining uh, Soviet Union. So I actually agree with the, your reading that yeah, it makes sense. And since Russia is now being cut from the innovation spur, then can hope that that will be that additional component to. Yeah, and, and a huge class. I mean, tens of thousands of Russians have just left the country, including a lot of people from the tech industry. I mean, so all the people who are working inside Russia in innovative ways. And Russia is a historically really creative, well-educated country with a great scientific tradition. Um, but a lot of the people who were powering it have, have just moved to Armenia, you know, or Kiev, you know, or Paris. Maybe not Kiev, but Paris. <laughs> Tbilisi, Tbilisi, they're all in Tbilisi. So the Georgians will be the beneficiaries. Volodymyr? Hi, I'm Volodymyr Fedorin. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for passing the floor to me. Uh, and uh, we met two months ago. Uh, it happens that we meet when uh, a war, the war is around the corner. And uh, my first question is, what were your expectations then, two months ago? Uh, we all remember this atmosphere in Munich, in the Munich Security Conference, when there were a lot of uh, talks about imminent or not so imminent war, 
we uh, participated in the poll in uh, during the Ukrainian dinner when less than uh, about a third of participants voted for uh, the war uh, was imminent. And now we are here. What were your personal expectations then? And what are your expectations now uh, after the two months of the most cruel war uh, in 70 years after the Second World War? Um, so, so, I mean, my feelings about the Munich Security Conference were very mixed. Um, I was very, and I, I wrote this afterwards, I was very disturbed there by this atmosphere. You know, you had the kind of Western leaders there, Kamala Harris was there and, um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen and, you know, all, you know, and there was, and there was a kind of feeling of cheerfulness and consensus that we are all together and we all agree that we all support Ukraine. Um, and then President Zelensky appeared and he made a really quite bitter and angry speech in which he said, I'm really glad you all support Ukraine, but actually we are alone and nobody's going to help us fight. And you had this, you had this deep contrast um, between, you know, in, you know, in those two different views. Um, and he was, you know, actually, you, you probably don't realize this, but his speech was quite effective. I mean, it was... It was um, it wasn't uplifting, but you know it affected people a lot. Because I, I traveled back from Munich with some American congressmen, and they were all you know they got the message, which was that um, your words of support don't really help us. We need you to actually do something. Um, and so you know that was my my feeling about that conference was that this contrast in views was exposed, and what was at that time the kind of emptiness of the Western position was exposed. Um, it became less empty as time went on. Um, you know, I I did expect a war to happen, but you know, I couldn't predict what kind of a war it would be. Um, I can't remember how I voted in that. I'd, I'd sort of forgotten that we had this, you know, contest. I, I was very, um, because pretty much all the Ukrainians I know thought it would not happen. You know, it was it was hard for me to know what to expect, and you know, what, they should know better than me. I mean, I'm 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 only I was only listening to the Pentagon and to the you know stuff that the um, U.S. administration was producing, and the Ukra many Ukrainians I knew said it was wrong. Um, so I didn't have a I didn't have a firm or clear view of what kind of a war it would be. Um, but now, of course, I understand that the reason so many Ukrainians um, said that is because they just were unable to believe it. Um, you know. Ukraine and Russia have had a deep and long relationship, you know, and they're, you know, the, a lot of Ukrainians do watch Russian movies, you know, to, and they understand Russian pop culture. And the idea that you could get that kind of, you know, as we've already discussed, this kind of genocidal war from a neighbor that, you know, you, you have many bad experiences with, but some good relationships with individual people. I mean, there are so many cross marriages across the border and so on. Um, I think was just impossible for people to believe. Um, it's also, you know, one person who knows defense and military strategy quite well, who I met in Kiev in December, said to me at the time, he got out this big map and he said, look, here's where the Russians are, you know, because by that time they were moving people to the border. And he got out this map and he said, they're moving people to the border. And he, but, you know, they don't have enough troops to occupy Ukraine. You know, they only have, I forget what the number was at that time, 150,000. And he said, you know, to occupy Ukraine, they need 400,000 or 500,000. So I just don't, I'm just not, you know. And of course, what, as it turns out, he was right. You know, they didn't have enough troops to occupy Ukraine, but that didn't mean they, they weren't going to try to invade. Um, so one of the reasons people got the war wrong was because um, a, as I said, it defied expectations and beliefs, and B, it, you know, it didn't look like the Russians had the military strength to do it, and it's true, they didn't, but they were going to try it anyway. Um, and as we now understand, this, this was because Putin had, you know, extremely poor information about Ukraine. I mean, extremely poor, you know, um, he understood it very badly, he had no idea who Ukrainians were, or he didn't understand that they would fight. I think he believed this rhetoric about it being a fake country or, you know, just in a NATO invention or something like that. Um, and he overestimated his own troops ability and massively underestimated the Ukrainians. Um, but, but so I, I should say, yes, I expected a war. Um, 
since that's, that's the precise question you asked, I mean, did I expect exactly this kind of war? I suppose I have to be with my Ukrainian friends and say, no, it was hard for me to believe um, that it would go this far. Um, not that they wouldn't try and take Kiev, I always believe that, but but that they, you know, that there would be this kind of, you know, use of violence against civilians and this, you know, this, for me, it's this behavior of the, you know, the, 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 the behavior of the Russian army mimicking exactly the behavior of the Red Army in Poland in, in 1944 and 1945, you know, that there would be this kind of almost exact repeat um, of the same kind of behavior that we've seen in the past. I think I, you know, that was hard for me to believe because I thought when I wrote about those things that I was writing history books <laughs> and I was not trying to predict the future. Um, so it's always a shock to see the past come back. Um, and that, I, I, so I, you know, that's my, you know, overly complicated answer. Uh, but the second part of my question was, what are your expectations now? After, what am I gathering, after gathering all this information, uh, nobody could think is possible like Bucha massacres or Irpin or this kind of uh, adventurism. Uh, what is your what are your so I, don't, I don't I don't I don't want to predict anything because I don't have a crystal ball and I I, I am also not um, it's not know, a lot of predictions about it's about a lot, expectations a lot of the a lot of the war is going to come down to what kind of weapons are available and how people use them and that's not something I'm an expert in and so I can't tell you um, but my my expectation now is that there will Ukraine will achieve some kind of victory. In other words, you, I, I do believe that the West and particularly Washington is now committed to the idea that there will be a sovereign and independent Ukrainian state that will emerge from this conflict. Um, how exactly its sovereignty will be protected, I don't know yet. You know, what exactly is the end game, I don't know yet. Um, but I think that the Ukrainians have so you have so successfully remade your image and remade, you know, the, the picture that people have of the nation, you know, especially in Washington, but also in London, Paris, Berlin, um, you know, Rome and so on, um, that I think, I think it, you know, it, it is, it is now seen as a kind of obligation of the Western world of NATO and the European Union to make sure that there's a, there's a Ukraine that survives the war. So, and more than survives that you know survives as a as a um, you know sovereign, independent, and strong state. But I can't tell you exactly what that will look like right now. Uh, and uh, at the same time, what is your definition of Ukrainian victory? So victory to me, I mean, real victory is you know complete victory would be that you expel Russian troops from all of your territory. Um, and then, then there is some kind of justice. So there's some kind of, I don't know whether it's going to be an international tribunal or some other form of justice so that people who have suffered are able to feel that they have a part in this victory too. And I mean the people in, you know, we, we know already about Bucha. Um, we don't know yet what's happening in Kherson. I mean, we can guess um, and other territories in the East. That would be a complete victory. Um, whether you can get a hundred percent of that, I don't know right now. Um, I, 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 I can't predict it. And the second but but certainly, certainly, I think that should be the goal. You know, that's that should be the goal of the of the of the military operation. And uh, what are prerequisites for this kind of uh, uh, end game for Ukraine? What uh, position uh, the West should take? What uh, percentage? I mean, right, right now, you know. Although, as I said, there's some people like Macron and others who who are interested in diplomacy and so on, and I, I don't think they're evil for wanting that. Um, but right now, the main, most important thing the West can do is to make sure that Ukraine wins on the battlefield, because Russia, as long as Putin is in charge, um, will is is going to negotiate from that position. So the, the farther they get into Ukraine and the more um, comprehensively they occupy new territory, the more, um, the more aggressive they will be in, in, create, in the post-war setup. So the, the best thing that we can do right now to ensure a better endgame and a better future is help you win. 
uh, we should and we will. Uh, uh, what is your forecast for this kind of political will on the West side? Uh, so I, I, again, I've spent a lot of the last couple of days trying to understand, since I got back from Kiev, trying to understand how people feel in Washington. Um, my, my perception is that in the last 10 days or week, that there has been a change. And some of the caution that people seem to feel two or three weeks ago is, is gone. And people are, I mean, the, the two recent weapons announcements, um, Biden made one a couple of days ago and another one today, um, are the first that include these really, you know, again, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm told this is what matters, these big pieces of heavy machinery and artillery, um, which, which can help win the war in Donbass. Um, and my feeling is that there has been a change in strategy. So the, as you know, I think we've had three phases in Washington. The first phase in the run up to the war and in the first kind of 72 hours was we think the war will be over in three days. We think the Russians will be in Kiev, you know, by whenever it was the weekend. Um, and, you know, our job is to get Zelensky out of there as fast as possible. That was that was literally the first in the in the run up to the war and the first three days of the war. That was what you would have heard in Washington. Um, there was just very little belief in the ability of the Ukrainian army to fight back. Um, in the when that didn't happen, there was a shift, um, and then there was a sort of a month in which the 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 Ukrainians were supplied with these tactical weapons, with javelins and, and also other stuff and intelligence and other stuff, but. Mostly it was things that were easy to get and get into Ukraine fast. Um, you know, and you also had other things too. You had the Turkish drones and so on. And, and that phase was like, oh, wow, the Ukrainians are doing much better than we expected. Let's, let's help keep them going. And then my perception is that in the last 10 days, and I don't know exactly why, I don't know whether this is because Zelensky has given a lot of interviews, you know, not just ours, but to other people, whether it's the you, you know Ukrainian success on the battlefield, the fact that the Russians withdrew from the north, um, um, and you know there seems to have been a shift again, and now it's like, you know, we have to help them win, um, and that I feel that this has happened in the last two weeks. Um, one of my guesses is that there was a lot of panic here, not panic, but fear or ang and fear is the wrong word to be sort of discussion and anxiety about whether um, whether the Russians, if they were trapped, would use nuclear weapons. And there was a lot, there was a great desire here not to seem to be escalating the conflict because, you know, then, you know, they didn't want it to look like a war between NATO and Russia. Um, I think that when the Russians withdrew and there was no, you know, they it, actually, it turns out they could withdraw, they could retreat and not set off a nuclear weapon or, you know, nuke Warsaw or whatever it was that people were afraid of. Um, when that happened, I think people here said, well, wait, hmm, you know, they, they can withdraw, they can change, you know, and then Putin suddenly announced new new goals for the war. You know, now the goal is, you know, whatever he's, he's saying about Donbass. Um, if he can do that with such alacrity, then maybe he doesn't, he isn't going to you know, he isn't going to escalate and then maybe. So I think there was a combination of things meant that in the last few, literally the last few days, there's been a kind of change. Um, and it's, it's, it's true in all the, you know, all over in most capitals. I mean, you know, I was just in Warsaw also and, but, you know, in Warsaw and Bratislava in, in London, um, you know, in Paris, you know, there's this, there's a, there's increasingly a feeling that, you know, we have to do everything that it takes. I mean, the one country where, you know, this is where there's still a huge argument going on is Germany. Um, but, um, but it is an argument, you know, there is a, there are two sides to it and publicly, and, you know, Ukraine is more and more popular and Schultz's government's refusal to engage more is unpopular. So that's already, we're in a different Germany than we were in a month ago. Thank you. you, you uh, I, I just wanted to ask you about Germany question, a Germany issue, because Tyler Cohn uh, wrote two months ago that Germany doesn't like uh, look a uh, member of the Western Alliance when Germany refused to 
uh, transmit uh, the weapons to Ukraine through its territory. Uh, it was just two months ago, and uh, now we have the discussion in, in Germany about uh, hard munitions, and it's... No, no, I mean, you know, it's, again, it's one, it's one of these things, there's, it's a glass half empty, or is the glass half full? I mean, so no, Germany is not sending its tanks to Ukraine, okay, and they haven't decided to do that yet. On the other hand, they aren't blocking anyone else from doing it, and there is a huge public debate about it in Germany. You know, much so. I I was actually on a German television program. I can't remember the exact day, but it was before the war. Um, it was probably in you know January, late January, early February. I was on a German television program, sort of big talk show where it was me. It was the Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, and three German politicians. Um, and the topic was should we arm Ukraine? And the, all three of the German politicians were adamantly against it. And I think they sort of brought me on the program to sort of make this case, you know, even though I'm not German, you know, as a, as, as a, um, you know, as a sort of, I don't know what, as a, you know, someone to throw rocks at, I don't know. Um, and I, you know, and you, ha and you had the feeling the Ukrainian ambassador to Berlin, you had this feeling of he's very great frustration and sort of anger and, um, and I have to say, since then, it sound, the, the debate in Germany has changed a lot. It's very different. Um, and finally, people are understanding that pacifism um, can also be evil. I mean, in that pacifism, if you don't fight back against, um, you know, against a genocidal state, then you are assisting that state in achieving its aims. And I think that message finally got through to a lot of Germans. And so, and so that's an achievement, even if we don't yet have the the German policies that we would like. Um, I'm think, uh, I think that you are one of the best uh, researchers on the so-called Soviet world, uh, about uh, gulags, about uh, prisoners camps, about uh, imperial thrust to the Eastern, uh, to Eastern or Central Europe, like uh, we call it now, about uh, Ukrainian uh, Holodomor, and my question to you is, what, uh, in, in your opinion, uh, in, in your opinion, is a mix of Soviet legacy, communism legacy, and Russian imperial uh, legacy to this push uh, that we are uh, we see again uh, these days from uh, from the Kremlin part, from Putin part. So. So it's it's clearly Soviet in that we're seeing exactly the same tactics and exactly the same kind of behavior um, in Ukraine that I you know I'm telling you I wrote I wrote a book on um, the Sovietization of Eastern Europe it was a book called Iron Curtain and it was about it was about what the Red Army and the NKVD did in the you know what they did over ten years but part of it the first part of the book is about what they did when they arrived in 1944 and 1945 um, in in um, first Eastern Poland, um, which is, you know, and then in, you know, the rest of Central Europe. And, you know, it's, it's like a, you know, it's a textbook example. I mean, frankly, it's what they did in Crimea too. So I saw it in Crimea as well. You know, they, um, they arrive with lists of people to arrest. Um, they look for, you know, people who have Ukrainian flags and Ukrainian textbooks in your house. I think you were their house, I think you were referring to that. Um, they, um, you know, they look for local police chiefs and mayors and, you know, leaders, and they're looking to decapitate the society and get rid of the leaders and then to terrorize ordinary people um, using both violence as well as rape. Um, and that's what they did in exactly, you know, identically what they did. I mean, and of course, those practices probably have an older origin in, in Russian Imperial Army culture. Um, and Russian, you know, secret police culture. So in that sense, they're they're part of that probably old tradition too. But really, the 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 main, you know, the main influence is Soviet. And the the fact is that the clearly the Russian army um, and you know the Russian state never went through anything like I mean, not even close to what the Germans went through in terms of seeking to understand what had gone wrong in the past, seeking to change the institutions to make them more humane. I mean, on the contrary, they, I mean, they literally seem to be using NKVD handbooks. I mean, they're doing, they're repeating the, 
exact behavior and the exact tactics of the NKVD from the 40s. Um, so, so it's very hard for me, you know, to, to, to identify it as anything else. I mean, for me, the whole thing feels very eerie. I mean, it's like, as I said, it's like seeing your book come alive, you know, it's, you know, and so I look at things like, oh, yeah, that's what it was like, you know. Um, now I understand, you know, what Lublin was like in, you know, 1944, um, when I see what's happening in Kherson right now. I mean, so it's a, it's a very, um, you know, it's, it's really an exact copy. And I should say that the NKVD, at least, I mean, I've never looked at Red Army archives, but I have looked at NKVD archives. The NKVD did do a lot of learning from its own experience. So they would write up their experience of events, and then they would sort of use that as teaching. You know, they would, they would, they read their own history and they use their own history in order to teach young recruits how to behave. And it looks to me like, you know, they're still using Soviet material to do that same, to do the same thing. It looks identical to me. It worked 70 years ago. Why to change uh, something like this? So uh, let's touch some post-war issues because I, I think we all are sure that the war uh, will end with a kind of uh, Ukrainian victory. And my question is about the um, uh, how this war, how will this war change European Union? The union that was uh, built on uh, the feeling that the big war in Europe uh, should ever happen again. What uh, changes in uh, maybe in institutions, in attitudes, uh, will this war uh, produce in Europe? First of all, I think it will produce Ukrainian membership of the European Union. I mean, I, I, it won't happen overnight because, you know, I, I was I was in, lived in Poland during Poland's accession to the EU. And there is a huge amount of stuff you have to do in order to join other than even if there is goodwill, which at that time there was. Um, but I think um, you, Ukraine will now be seen as a European state in a way that it wasn't before. Um, so that will be one big change. And that's a really big change because Ukraine is a big country. And so therefore its presence will be felt inside Europe in the way that the presence of Eastern Europe also changed um, the EU. So that's that's one kind of change. I mean, I think the, you know, I'm hesitant to predict this because they're, because again, we, I don't see exactly who the leaders are who, right now who would, who would do this, but um, it's pretty clear to me that Europe needs to think of itself um, not just as an economic power, but also as a security power. Um, and I'm not sure yet how that thinking will manifest itself, whether it will just mean that, you know, Germany spends more on weapons or whether the reinforcement of NATO or whether there will be as there, you know, as there could be some kind of European army or European, um, you know, some kind of European security establishment that's different from the NATO. I mean, NATO, I don't think is going to go away. I mean, uh, you know, you know, what I'm hoping is that the European part of NATO becomes more developed and stronger. Um, and that, I mean, for example, um, there are a lot of European countries that don't really have armies and don't really have foreign policies. Um, you know, the Netherlands, I mean, um, Austria. Oh, you, uh, you, you, you mean that uh, Europe should, um... Uh, rise up its defense expenditures and to become uh, a more a meaningful part of NATO. Yes, it should be a more meaningful part of NATO, and maybe it needs its own, you know, its own way of thinking about security too. Because there are some issues that the U.S., you know, we don't want them to be totally dependent on the U.S. forever. Um, and Europe, as a as a as a whole, you know, when you add all the countries together, is just as rich as the U.S. Um, and has the same kind of economic and industrial clout. Um, and so why shouldn't it also have some kind of strategic thinking and some kind of way of, you know, form of self-defense? Um, but we're, we're still pretty far from that. So, you know, it's something some people have been talking about for a long time, but um, I don't see it happening immediately. But, but, you know, wars do have a way of galvanizing change. So maybe that's one of the things that will come out of this. 
Um, I have two uh, more questions. One uh, very important about Ukraine. We all hope that Ukraine will be victorious. Uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, our nation uh, will endure this uh, war of annihilation. Uh, and uh, we will win, but, but how to use our victory to, to become more, even more resilient, even more European nation, not losing chances uh, as our country, unfortunately, did several times uh, before. I mean, that's really a question that you would have to answer. You'll be better at answering than me because um, you, you know, I mean, we'll do. <laughs> but uh, we, need, uh, we are interested in your advice. In your... I mean, obvi obviously, you know, the power of a small group of rich people um, who have dubious links to Russia and to international crime and so on has to end. You know, so the um, this, you know, the 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 oligarchy and the, you know, this particularly it's not so much the petty corruption. Lots of countries have that, including, you know, France and Germany, but um, you know a lot of this making sure that this system of deep corruption doesn't come back. You know, whereby everybody who works for the Ministry of Economics is also separately paid by some oligarch. You know, um, you know, strengthening the state so that it's a um, and um, you know making sure that civil servants are you know qualified people who have real salaries. Um, making sure that the state has has also has its um, is is able to be stronger than all of its citizens, you know, and, and here, you know, again, there are many European countries that don't quite match this ideal either, but pushing Ukraine further in that in that sense in the direction of modernity where you have a um, where you have um, you know, bureaucrats and civil servants, you know, and an army and security services who work for the state and not for a private people on the side. Um, making sure that that's really, you know, that's the most important thing. Um, so, uh, oh, so you recommend us to have uh, gardens like more Poland, like more in Poland. This in which, in which sense, like Poland. no, well, no oligarchs, more regular, uh, regular bureaucracy, and so on. Yeah. So. Mm. Poland is unfortunate. Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Poland is now run by a political party that's unfortunately trying to dismantle some of that and actually create oligarchs. We didn't have that before. Um, and actually undermine the independent bureaucracy and so on. And one of the struggles that's going on in Poland now is to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, also, they, you know, the biggest assault they've done is on the independent court system um, and the judiciary. And pushing back against that is a really important, um, you know, it's very important that that wins in Poland. But, but yes, I mean, so, so, so if Ukraine were, were to push in the direction of Poland as it was six years ago, yes. Okay, and the last question, and uh, the situation reminds me about it, uh, uh, air raid alarm in, the, in, in, in Kyiv. The question is about what sh should the world do with Russia, Ru the Russian question. What, uh, sh how do we think the ramp off of this country uh, after Putin, with Putin or after Putin? Uh, because uh, in my opinion, uh, we see that without very, very deep restructuring, uh, the, this kind of country, this kind, uh, kind of nation, uh, will uh, remain the threat to the to its neighbors, to the other world. What do you think about this? Well, we've tried um, integrating Russia, and that was a failure. Um, now it looks to me. I'm saying this is what will happen, not what necessarily what it should have. Now we're going to try isolating Russia. Um, and I think what's going to happen in the next couple of years is that Russia will be um, cut off economically and culturally from the rest of the world. Um, and that will be that de fact that in fact is what the policy will be. Um, the question of what happens inside Russia and 
um, how the country evolves and how Russians react to this isolation and this um, this kind of feeling of loneliness, whether they- Excuse react. me, excuse me, Anne. Anne I, I want to make my question more exact. What we as Ukrainian neighbors, uh, Ukrainian neighbors in the uh, in its closest proximity, its neighbors on the planet, what should we demand uh, from this country with Putin, without Putin, uh, it doesn't matter, uh, in order to uh, to do things, to do deals with uh, this country again? What are our red lines? What are our demands to I mean, normalize? Should, well. I mean, you should you should demand that Russia behaves um, like a um, a civilized part of the world that you want to live in, and you should demand that they respect your borders, and you should demand that they, um, you know, that they, you know, that that people who've committed crimes in your country are are brought to justice. I mean, you have a right to continue to demand that, and you should do. Um, should we demand uh, internal? Uh, should we demand some internal reforms? I mean, dismantling these. You, you can demand them, but you know, there, then once again, we're at the question of what influence do we actually have? You know, you don't want to demand things that you can't achieve. Um, uh, by demanding, by the actors of demanding, I mean not only Ukraine. I mean the West as a whole. Uh, should West. Uh, demand from Russia to dismantle uh, successors of NKVD, of uh, this kind of imperial uh, uh, indoctrination, uh, this kind of propaganda. This is what I wanted in the 1990s, I wrote endlessly. <laughs> in order, in order to lift sanctions, in, in order to lift sanctions, in order to trade with the... Oh, I see what you're asking. Yes, actually. I mean, if, you know, we, that's, so, I mean, my, my, my feeling about Russia more general, more sort of more broadly, I didn't quite understand your question, is that our main problem is that we haven't had any kind of strategy towards Russia. So everything that we've done towards Russia, especially in the last eight years, has been reactive. So they kill somebody in Germany and we react, you know, they kill, they murder someone in London, we react. They do this, they violate this rule or that rule, we react. What we haven't had is a clear policy of what we want Russia to be or the way that we hope Russia will develop. Um, and I think what you're asking, and I think it's correct, is that we should use sanctions as part of that leverage. So we want Russia to be a, um, a civilized member of, of Europe. Um, and therefore, we need, um, in, in order to achieve that, it will have to you know, res not just respect borders and not just um, uh, and not just um, bring to justice people who've committed crimes, um, but yes, also that it should begin dismantling the, the, the security services and particularly the propaganda state um, that has you know, brainwashed its citizens. And so, yes, I do think we could make those part of our requirements for lifting sanctions. I mean, with the caveat that you know, Russia, there's a part of the Russian elite, and this is Putin is of course the center of it, which is happy about the sanctions and happy about the isolation because it means that, you know, then they can really do whatever they want. Um, so, you know, what we have to hope for is that m the majority of the population doesn't accept that. So, and the audience helps me with the more precise question. Uh, if uh, Russia proves to be not, uh, uh, can't, uh, if it can't uh, integrate into the uh, rest of the world if it can't uh, dismantle its security state should the west or uh, russian neighbors uh, to uh, have a goal to disintegrate this uh, polity i mean russian federation uh, as as a final goal in in this uh, secular struggle that we have for hundreds of years um, no, I don't think our goal should be to disintegrate Russia. I mean, it may be that that's what happens, um, but I don't think that should be our aim, no. Um, I think our aim should be to change the nature of the state, to, to civilize it. Thank you very, very much, Anne. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that you are one of the most important public intellectuals of our time, and I'm looking forward for another discussion. And thank you for all you do for the world and for Ukraine. Thank you. You're you're overly flattering. I mean, you know, you you and Kiev are the people who are brave, not 
you know, the rest of us outside of here. So thank you all for what you're doing and, you know, good luck to your, to your school and keep it going. And, you know, I'll come next time I'll be in Kiev for longer and I'll come in real life. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.